In a little while, I'm going to be noticing a video. It fits in with the lesson. But we will be a little while getting to that video. If you have your songbooks, I want you to turn to number 14. This is familiar to members of the Lord's Church because we often sing it after a person has obeyed the gospel. Number 14 is called A New Creature. The first line reads, Buried with Christ, my blessed Redeemer, dead to the old life of folly and sin. Satan may call, the world may entreat me, there's no voice that answers within. We sing that because we teach as the New Testament teaches. That the mode of baptism is not sprinkling water on someone's head. And it is not pouring water on one who is a proper subject of baptism. As baptizing is something done, it is an act performed. If sprinkle, pour, and immerse as distinct acts all constitute baptizing, then we have three distinct acts that are equal to the same thing or same act which is baptize. Surely in the common language that we all can speak, we recognize that sprinkle is not poor, nor is poor sprinkle, and neither of these acts are equivalent to the act immerse. If the act of sprinkling or to sprinkle is equal to the act baptized and the act pour differs from the act sprinkle could the act pour be equal to the act baptized since the act immerse differs from both the act sprinkle and pour can the act immerse equal uh, baptized too if immersing is baptism, and all say that it is that I know anything in the world about, since sprinkling or pouring water on a person differs from the act immerse, we may say it this way, how in the name of reason can one call it by the same name? Immersion is baptism, but sprinkling or pouring water on a person differs from the act immersion and therefore cannot be the same thing. When you're reading the will of Jesus Christ, now notice the will of your Savior Jesus Christ. He's your Savior. He knows how to save you. He's done everything heaven could do that you couldn't do to provide salvation. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 that baptism doth also now save us. Then surely we must pay attention to His will. We must be careful about what we understand when it comes to the study of the Bible. I ask you to in general think about how much the Bible says about being very careful about your study of God's Word. There's no way, once again, to carry out what is printed above my head back here in Colossians 3.17, except that you're careful to know the authority of Christ presented in the words of Christ, because in the words of Christ is the will of Christ. So He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14 and verse 6. When you read about the cases of conversion that's found in the book of Acts. And I might also mention there are cases of non-conversion 
in the book of Acts, more probably some of the Acts of some of the apostles. We find the, the case of the Ethiopian eunuch or the great treasure of Candace. And in reading that particular passage, I'm thinking of several others too at the time, in reading that, I'm mindful of the fact that when he was reading from Isaiah 53 and the Holy Spirit told Philip to join himself to that chariot and Philip heard him reading, he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Well, it would have been a different story with what Philip did next if he had said, no, and I don't really care to. Go mind your own business. I don't know what Philip would have done. But this man is a devout person. He's driven hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles to do what he knew the law of Moses required of him to do to worship God. And out there in a desert place, he is reading from Isaiah 53. He's trying to figure out, and he tells Philip, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. And Philip begins at the same scripture and preaches unto him Jesus. And the next thing you run into is that when they came into a certain water, he said, see here is water, what doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they stopped that chariot. And when they got out of the chariot, they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he, that is Philip, baptized him, the eunuch. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Now we know that Christ in the Great Commission in Mark's account <coughs> said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why the gospel? Paul tells us in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth that is your first and all sort of the Greek. So everyone, being a free moral agent, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, needs to hear the gospel. That's how God's favor or grace reaches them is through the gospel message. Therein God's located His power to forgive men of their sins for all have sinned. So the church is charged starting with the apostles to go into all the world and preach that gospel to every creature. Now when we go through the scriptures, we see then that they are preaching the power of God to save men from sin, and it's to be preached to every creature. So when a person is hearing the gospel preached, he's hearing the power of God that's capable of forgiving him of all sins against God. Okay, so we see then in the case of Philip, and his preaching Jesus, that some way in the process of preaching Jesus, this man wanted in a desert place to stop as soon as they came to water. And he wanted to be baptized. It's impossible to preach Jesus as Philip preached Jesus without preaching the plan of salvation. And you cannot preach the plan of salvation and not preach baptism. For in Mark's account, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Remember, that's God's power to save to every creature. Then he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. On the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached. Thus the evidence presented that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. This preaching was to devout Jews who, like the Ethiopian eunuch, were devoted to doing what God said unto the law. And that's why they're in Jerusalem now anyway. They're not people who don't care about God. They're not hypocrites. They're devout. Same word is used there to describe Cornelius. They're devoted to God through the law they knew that was their approach to God. Now they learned something in the preaching of Peter and the rest of the apostles they could not know otherwise. 
And that is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the long sought for and looked for Messiah. So, the evidence is presented in the preaching of the gospel. If you want to have the evidence that is efficient to convict you that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, then the gospel, rightly divided, must be preached. For in it is the power of God to save men from sin. Jesus saves through Jesus' gospel. And it's to be preached to every creature. So these were persuaded that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. For they are believers when they're pricked in their heart by the truth and cry out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37 of Acts 2. He takes them as believers in Christ and says, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so on and so forth. In verse 41 says that they that gladly received the word were baptized. And they were added unto them. That is, added unto the church, as does verse 47 say, that those that were saved were added to the church. Now, when you go back over to the baptism of the eunuch, you don't have what happened when they got out in the water. If that's all you had, you might say, what did they do? Well, we said, well, it's obvious he buried him in the water. You can't tell that from that passage alone. Now get that. If you don't watch out, you draw from all the other passages you've been studying all your life on baptism. And you conclude that by reading Acts chapter 8. But if that's all you knew, you would know they got out of the chariot and they went down into the water and something happened called baptism and then they came up out of the water. But that's not all the New Testament has to say on the meaning of baptism. First of all, we won't spend a lot of time on this. The Greek word, baptizo, means to dip or, pl or plunge or immerse. Period. That's what it means. But we don't even have to know that in our English translations to understand what happened when Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized the eunuch, then they came up out of the water. Because when I'm reading Paul's letter to the Romans, they're Christians and they did the same thing this eunuch did to become Christians. And in order to exhort them and motivate them to continued faithfulness to the Lord, he reminded them of what they did when they became Christians. And so he writes in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Know ye not, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, now there are several other facts involved in the reasoning here, but here's the conclusion. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Stop. Does anyone here understand a burial? I once argued with a young man when I was a freshman in college because he was a Methodist, and Methodists don't believe you have to be immersed in water. They don't believe you have to be buried in water. They believe in just putting a little water on your head. I know my grandmother was a Methodist. My daddy came out of Methodism. And when I was pointing out these verses to him, he said, well, the Indians bury, and they put them up on a, a scaffold. I said, they're not buried either. They're put up on a scaffold. Now I said, let me take that further and show you my point. When they cover them up with blankets on that, that scaffold, they're buried under the blankets. But just putting somebody up on a scaffold because he's dead doesn't mean he's buried. He's put up on a scaffold. Now if you want to cover him completely up on top of the scaffold, that, that's fine. He's then buried. And all you have to do it seems so simple is go to a graveyard. Well, we can't be more sophisticated and say we go to a cemetery. But there's dead bodies in all of them. 
and they're all buried. Yeah, but what if they're in the mausoleum? Folks are covered up. They're burying that mausoleum. It's just the same as burying people under blankets or Indians are put up on a scaffold. They're buried. Now, in this case, there's a burial in water, and we understand from Romans 6, it's a pattern of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what you've got in verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then, when? When you obeyed the form of doctrine. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Not before, but when you were buried according to that form, that pattern of doctrine, that pattern of teaching. What was it? The death. The burial and resurrection of Christ. And they were buried with their Lord in the waters of baptism. Now we have an understanding why they had to stop that chariot. When they came to water that had to be sufficiently deep enough to immerse the body in. That they went down into the water. And there he baptized him. He buried him. And then they came back out of the water. You know, if sprinkling or pouring were sufficient, surely he had drinking water there. They could have stood in the chariot just sprinkling on his head. But that wasn't the case. Even in a desert place, the water was not to be found so easy. But that's not the only passage that makes it very clear that baptism of the Great Commission that saves men according to 1 Peter 3.21 is a burial. Paul writing the church in Colossae. They all became members of the church the same way. They all heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel in the same way. In verse 12 of Colossians 2, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. It's a parallel to Romans 6, 3, and 4. You're obeying a form of the teaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You're baptized because you're a dead man. You're dead to the world when you repented. Some people say, well, you're saved at the point of belief. And then you're baptized because you were saved. They don't realize they're breaking the form. You bury a dead person. You don't bury a live person. But if a person is made alive spiritually at the point of belief without any other actions of obedience, and then you bury him, you buried a live person. But in the steps in the plan of salvation, you believe on Christ on the basis of the evidence of the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And in that Word of God, which is the authority of Jesus Christ, your Savior, He then commands you to repent, Acts 17, 30, Luke 13, 3, and verse 5. And then, if you're serious about the whole matter, listen and learn, and you want forgiveness, you'll be like that eunuch. In a desert place, you'll stop that chariot as soon as water deep enough to bury your body in shows up. And you'll want to be baptized on your profession of faith in Christ. So one is buried in water. That is baptizing in the death of Christ. A dead man's buried. That's why when you're raised, you're a new creature. That's why it's called in John 3, 3 and 5, born of water and the Spirit. You're born into the family of God. It's a new birth. Different ways of trying to get us to understand the significance of baptism. Now, let me hasten to say there are a number of things in the Scriptures that God says saves us. So we're not saying baptism alone saves us. The blood of Christ saves us. The love of God saves us. The Bible saves us. The grace of God saves us. But the point where Christ applies the blood shed in His death to us to remit our sins in His mind is when we're baptized into His death. For in His death He shed His blood. You're buried, covered up with water, the watery grave of baptism, and that's how it is you're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. That's why we sing the song, Psalm 14, buried with Him. Now, we understand a burial. I want to look at this uh, video right now. Last week, a few days ago, on Facebook, 
This brother, who you can see here, and I don't know how well it's seen in the back, this brother, Mark Tabata, or Tabata, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, posted this on Facebook. Now this man that you see sitting in the water is so ill, he had, uh, you can't see it right here, but he had uh, oxygen tubes on. And Tabata told me himself that it took him several hours to get straightened up so he could get down into the water. If you see close enough, which probably from the back you can't, they didn't fill the thing up as much as they ought to to take care of a man like that in his physical condition. But then, you can't see it in the picture, but if you could see his arm, which is his right arm, and see also his left, that his wife is holding one of them and the preacher, Mark, is holding the other. Now keep in mind what your Lord said, please. What your Lord said in his last will and testament. Because I want to say this. Every time I have ever been instrumental in doing what this man's doing and assisting somebody to bury him in water, first of all, I knew what bury meant. That does not seem hard to me to understand. And those assisting are just that. They're assisting a person to obey his Lord. Now, to obey somebody is to do what he said, the way he said it, for the reason he said it, sometimes when he said it. So if you'd play the whole thing now, Gary, I want you to watch. He's holding on to the side, and I think that's his wife. He's holding his hand. Now, this is deliberate action, and watch. Question, was he buried? You know what I got when I talked to him about this via Facebook? Oh, I think he's, it, it serves a purpose. I have all of the case you want to read it because we had an exchange. If you can leave one part of the human body out and it's a burial, why put any part under at all? Well, you say sometimes people make mistakes. Yes, I've been around a number of actual baptisms where people just didn't realize they were not getting water. And you'll be surprised baptizing somebody. It's like uh, fighting a three-year-old that doesn't want to take a bath. It takes everybody's half-sister to get everything under the water. Why are we that particular? Because bury is bury is bury is bury, and that's the Lord's will. It's that simple. We have an example because he brought this up trying to say I was being too strict and that he had spoke to the gentleman here that he proposes to baptize and asked him about that. The gentleman said, well, I'm satisfied. And he said, Devada did, well, since he's satisfied, I'm satisfied. Did anybody ever think to say, is God satisfied? Did you do what God said do and the way God said do it and for the reason God said do it? Now, some people get the idea that we're the only ones that's ever baptized somebody in dire straits physically. So I reminded him of a time when I baptized a lady that was extremely sick. She couldn't even do like this man. She couldn't sit up. She had on an oxygen mask. That's when they tended to put masks on rather than the little nose pieces. She wanted to be baptized. So we went to the hospital, got permission from the hospital, and since she had no family, we didn't have to look to that. We got a nurse who was willing to help us, and we got a hospital orderly. We took her down by a gurney, down to the area where they worked with burn people. And you know when they debris, I think is the word for it, the dead skin off of burn people, they put them in what came to be called a burn tank, it's water where they can uh, immerse someone, and it's a very painful thing is they take off the necrotic skin. So that's the best way we could think that we could help her. Notice we're assisting her in obedience to her Lord. It's a passive thing on her part. We're assisting her to obey her Lord. So what we did, she was helped up onto that mechanical stretcher that was let down by a machine into the water. We put her on that. Still hooked up their oxygen and let her down all the way to the point to where there's only this much of her out of the water. I explained to the nurse, the orderly, what I was going to do. 
And then we went through the usual process. As soon as I got ready to put her head under the water, the nurse took her oxygen mask off. We put her under the water, and I always do this to make sure everything goes under the water. We put her head under the water, raised her up. The nurse had a towel, wiped her face off, put the oxygen mask back on, they raised her up, dried her off, put her on the gurney. She never even began to set up like this man. I just simply believe by the authority of the New Testament, if I'm going to assist somebody to be buried, I assist them to be buried. That's the command. Now, someone posted on there regarding the comments that Tabata made. Said the only reason he felt good about it, he's been taught he could feel good about it even when he wasn't fully buried. Christianity is a taught religion. Error is a taught thing. Well, have you ever had people make mistakes? Yes, there can be legitimate, honest mistakes, as I described to you a while ago. But as one fellow posted on there, never let them get out of the Baptist studio, you. you've got them completely under the water. And that's right. So what you do if you make a mistake, you correct it. I don't know how many times I've seen honest, right-hearted people make a mistake at the Lord's table. They pick up the bread and then start offering the prayer for the fruit of the vine, or they do the other way around, or they offer one before the other. I can remember countless occasions where people just simply misacted. It happened to everybody in one way or the other. I've seen even song leaders announce one song, start on another. Well, we're to do all things decent and order, and that the thing we're to obey is. So what do you do when you make honest mistakes? You correct them. So if some, somebody says, well, he made an honest mistake. Well, you look at it and decide where he made an honest mistake. He made a mistake. Could he have corrected it? Why didn't he? You see, this is the world we're living in, and this is the church we're living in today. And that's the reason the church throughout the country is apostate. Because people see this, they start trying to say, well, well he tried. When you read of the Old Testament account of Israel leaving Egyptian bondage, which was a type of sin, led by Moses, who was a type of Christ. Paul said in the New Testament, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were immersed in water, because clouds water vapor. And I think we know the sea's water. Not a soul could be freed from Egyptian bondage regardless of his physical condition if he was not baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. If he didn't want to go through that baptism, as Paul calls it by the Holy Spirit, he stayed in Egypt. So somebody may have had to assist a bunch of old folks and sick folks since they're talking about a physical nation that's a type of spiritual Israel and others to get through the Red Sea. But unless they went through the Red Sea, they were not delivered from Egyptian bondage regardless of their physical status, of their age, or babies, or whatever else. Somebody had to help somebody else get through that passage. Baptized, as Paul said, in a cloud and in the sea. Now, does that teach us something? Paul said it did. He said these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And since the Ethiopian eunuch surely had drinking water, he didn't need, if sprinkling and pouring or partial immersion is all right, to wait till he got to a certain water, which meant deep enough to bury a fellow in. I know that, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12, and I know it also from the Old Testament by that type of being baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Well, let's leave this one and go to the next one. Same man, same place. Only this woman, there's nothing wrong with her that I can tell, and he didn't say that she did. Now, you can't hear him because if we played it, you still couldn't hear it that well. But he tells her, I'm going to baptize your whole body under the water. He says, whole body under the water. Well, it'll take a minute for it to get there, but you can see what he did. 
Let me ask you, how many of you have been involved, of course men, in aiding people and being obedient to their Lord and being buried in water? How many? Give me a show of hands of the men. How many of you? Have you helped? There's several of you. Were you concerned about that person being buried in water or just partially buried? Now watch what goes on. First of all, they could have put a lot more water in that. It may not appear, but it made a big difference having baptized a lot of folks. Now watch. He's telling her here that he's going to baptize her and put her whole body under the water. What did your eyes tell you? If you could see it. Her arm stuck up. Of course, you noticed this one remark was made on there when he came up, he flipped some water in her face, and so I said, I guess that covered the elbow. Watch it again. Stomach, chest, elbows. So his concept and definition of hope, see, there you go. I got it. Uh, that tells you right there something that's even worse in this disobedient act. It's the attitude persisting in the church today about authority and about what it is to be fully obedient to whatever God says. If it doesn't make any difference, brethren, what I preach to you here from the scriptures, reading that way in your own Bibles, don't make a bit of difference, and nobody will be held accountable on the day of judgment for that. Yet Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge me in the last day. Did Christ say what he meant regarding burial in water? And did he mean what he said? And do we understand what obeying His commandments are? And the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And Hebrews 5 and verse uh, 9 says, He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Question. Did these two people obey Him in baptism? No, they did not. Any more that if there's a Methodist somewhere around here today and somebody wants to be in that church, they pour a little water on her head. Let me tell you this and then I'll close. Before my daddy became a Christian, and I was probably about eight, nine years old, every once in a while he would go because he was still studying himself and he was trying to study with his mother. And in those days, any kind of religious assembly just ran over the building, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever. So they had a meeting. They still believed in evangelizing in those days. And I could still, that building's still there. I could still go to it, sit pretty close to where I was sitting that night. Though I was probably, as I say, about eight or nine, maybe. I don't think I was ten, more like eight or nine. So we went there, and the Methodist preached, of course, being that uh, little, I, I don't remember a thing he said. And um, there was somebody responded when they had the invitation. They actually had an invitation, which a lot of people don't anymore. And, uh, and they ended up just taking some water in his hand and putting it on the man's head. That's all I can remember. But I saw that in my own eyes, like you saw this. Well, my grandmother had been studying with Daddy, and he had been emphasizing that baptism is a burial and showing such scriptures as this. There was a great crowd of people, and she was sitting up like this. We were sitting up fat, and the auditorium was three times the size of this one. So when everything broke up, the last amen was said, of course, everything filled up. And I, I can see my grandmother now trying to get back there to Daddy. And I was trying to see my grandmother. So she couldn't get to Daddy, but she got to me. And she says, you be sure and tell Roland there was more water in his hand than he looked like. <laughs> Quote, unquote, from the one I love very much. But she was wrong when it came to what constitutes baptism. But that said a whole lot going to her mind. By the way, later on she determined she should be immersed in water. She never left the Methodist church. Brethren, what are we going to do about the things we do? Shall we just say, okay, let's just do it with the Lord's Supper? 
Or let's just have one prayer. After all, we're always trying to save time. Let's just have one prayer for the bread and fruit of the vine at the same time and serve one right behind the other. Wouldn't that be all right? Why do we serve the bread in the first place? And why do we pray? What does the bread represent? Where do we learn all that? Cautious, careful study of the Bible and knowing what is obligatory from what is not obligatory. The pans, this uh, containers that the Lord suffers in, that's, that's not obligatory. Since everyone's to partake of it as an act of worship, then there must be some way it's gotten out to you. But we do know the Lord instituted and in instituting the Lord's Supper, took bread and break it, gave thanks over it, and then told everybody to partake of it. And did the same thing with the fruit of the vine and told each one of us what it represents. And we follow that order. That is the way that is right and cannot be wrong. We've lost that spirit, folks. We start immediately trying to justify people when they haven't done what we know our own Bible says. And we start trying to find a loophole. I never will forget there is a commentator called Loophole, pretty good commentary. Brother Deaver used to say, that's the one the brethren use. They're looking for the loopholes. And that's what brethren do. Why can't we look the other way and say, let's be cautious. Let's be careful. This has to do with going to heaven or hell. And let's be sure we've done what our Lord said and the way He said do it. And the reason, or more than one reason, if it's the case, or when. Why can't we be that careful? I had quite a discussion with this fellow. And he blames me for being over -stickler. He even brought up the thief on the cross. And this man has gospel preacher over his head. Brother, that's where we are. And just simply because you've been privileged for most of you to hear the truth preached for years, don't think it's that way everywhere. And I'm not just talking about coming from me. So I simply say today, do you want to become a Christian? If so, having believed in Christ, repented of your sins, and confessed your faith in Him, you must be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of your sins because that's when the Lord applies the blood shed on the cross for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you sin, the second law of pardon is to repent of those sins. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And what better time than now, while you're thinking about the seriousness of being saved, to respond to the gospel invitation if you need, while we stand and sing.